Hey friends, hey family, hey loved ones. How are you today? Hey, I wanted to pop on and share a couple things that I've been working through, playing through, seeing into. And so, yeah, that's been like a huge potent week uh, to look into like the internal landscape. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just pay attention to what's kind of coming up to be seen. And so I have had, yeah, a lot of good things emerge for me or reemerge to look back into more deeply. And um, yeah, I, I had some surprising like things come up in the last couple days uh, that, it, that I've been just um, kind of allowing just to unfold for me or to reveal itself without feeling like the need to fix it or the need to make it wrong or the need to make myself wrong, or the need to make, like, others wrong, and just, like, really open to allowing, like, the healing to take place, and allowing my mind to change, and, um, yeah, looking into some of these things that kept me separate from myself, with capital S, and we, like, what was preventing me from being one with me and we, and what was separating me or cutting me off from my true being. And yeah, there's a lot of mechanisms and a lot of strategies, ego strategies uh, to cut through and just to see through. And so one of those things, yeah, that I inherited and our adopted was this uh, strategy of self-pity, which is a strategy of self-importance, making myself important or making, yeah, me different in some sort of way from everyone else. And like part of me knows that that is a valid assessment or an accurate assessment in certain ways, but in, in other ways, it's not true. And so, yeah, just kind of looking into these things where this inner saboteur has been at play, like trying to keep reinforcing the same old story um, to keep me frozen, stuck, comfortable and safe. Yeah, to just to play small, to keep playing small and to keep up, um, keep reinforcing that victim story or that victim identity. And um, yeah, so then, you know, like looking into some things and uh, choosing compassion, forgiveness, mercy, and empathy, and uh, reminding myself of what's really true and what, what I know, yeah, what I know to be true, what I really know, what my heart knows, what my soul knows. And, um, yeah, just remembering that and reminding myself like, to allow it to be all it is, and what it gets to be. And so sometimes these stories come up and they're not <laughs> the stories that I want to see sometimes. <laughs> but, yeah... I know there's something in it for me and so I'm willing to look into it and free me to be. So bringing in the witness and that neutrality and like also like having that compassion and that acceptance for the voice that is telling me this sad, 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 sad story that really makes me want to cry and feel sorry for myself or feel sorry for the world or feel sorry for others because it has felt so wrong and so yeah and that's one of my strategies too is uh, trying to reinforce the rightness <laughs> so that I can feel right and so some of that entails making something else wrong making myself wrong, making the other wrong, making the whole situation wrong. 
And so, like, there's a part of me that knows that it's not wrong, that it's all right, that it's right to be, that it's right to unfold how it is meant to be. And it's meant to play out in certain ways uh, to help us see certain things that we haven't been able to see. And so instead of outright rejecting what I'm seeing, I would like to hold the space for wonder and curiosity or just neutrality. And so, yeah, some of the things that I've been looking at is like self-pity, self-importance, separate me, cut off me, poor me, I'm alone, and no one has the psychological or emotional capacity to fully understand me or where I'm coming from or be able to relate to my experience of what I'm seeing, perceiving, and experiencing. And it feels lonely not to be able to share my story authentically with my family or have my true reality be validated, accepted, or understood. Ah, oh, sad, sad story. The ego playing the victim, orphan, martyr, the chosen one, the cut off one. And one part of myself yeah, for one part of myself, the story feels true, but another aspect knows that it is not true and that it's an agenda to keep me safe and small. And it is dishonoring as it dismisses the other and their own internal power to see, empathize, and relate or evolve their own consciousness and claim their own freedom, power, and ways of seeing, being, and perceiving their own freedom to be. So we don't need to share the same beliefs, stories, identities, views, or experiences to share love, connection, and camaraderie. <laughs> so we don't need to share the same beliefs, stories, identities, views, or experiences to share love, connection, and camaraderie, and unity, to be in presence and acceptance together as one. Being one. Being one. One being. So what am I rejecting to protect my little sense of self by creating or making the wrong one? Making one of us wrong or seeing one of us as wrong, making one wrong or both of us wrong or all of it wrong or wrong to be. So I allow myself my limitations and my strengths and I allow others their limitations and their strengths. I allow others to be accountable to and for themselves I allow the room and I allow the space. I allow all things to exist. I allow all things their place. I allow for all possibilities. I allow for healing and change to take place. I allow room for the wounded and the healed feminine. I allow room for the wounded and the healed masculine. I allow room for it all to be, for it all to change, for it all to be freed. So what was coming up for me and yeah, I've kind of kind of kept like some of these things, some of these stories to myself because I was afraid of being judged, like for thinking certain things or believing certain things. But I know it's just like a old program and an old coping mechanism and an old strategy. It's not really me. And so I was judging myself for like feeling these feelings and believing these things and it's kept me like separate and cut off from the love I need for me it's the pain that I carry it's the love that I've withheld from me and certain members of my family because they were showing me different parts of me that I had rejected about myself and so I did have a lot of expectations and a, a lot of hopes and desires and fears just like we all do so I wasn't allowing that for myself like for myself to have my own experience to freely have my own full experience because I thought it was wrong for me to 
to be this way. And I also remembered, you know, like when I was having these things come up, what it was was just feeling sad because um, some of my loved ones and, you know, um, don't share the same perceptions or the same viewpoints or, yeah, they're not having the same experience, obviously, we're all having a different experience, but I felt like so alienated and kind of ostracized, but I'm just kind of have a belief that there's no way like that they will, would be able to open to see through my eyes, you know? And I don't, I just was like curious about like, why is that so important to me? Like that they see what I'm seeing, that they understand, you know? So they can see certain things about me that validate like, that I am right to be, so they don't see me as wrong or undeserving or unworthy. And I don't know why that was so important to me, like, that I was seen fairly or seen in the light of fairness or fullness. I don't really know, but I'll invite that part of me that does know so that this other part of me that doesn't know and feels like it needs to figure it out can just let go. And so what I had remembered was that we all do have the answers that we need within, within ourselves. And so that kind of was like unjust and unjust. <laughs> belief that I had held um, about like them not being able to get it or not being able to understand and it is like a familiar script because um, it was something that one of my sisters would just uh, go off about like um, it was her main script of no one understands me you don't understand me nobody understands me and um, yeah, cutting herself off from everyone else and making herself important um, and separate from everyone else, like through this self-pity and self-sabotage. And so I know it's an inherited family pattern um, in certain ways, like to feel so, 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 so sorry for ourselves. And then we can get so stuck there in a lot of ways. But like on a daily basis, I'm not like, that's not like my main programming that's like, <laughs> my main focus like definitely not like it's just something that's coming up like right now like for me to see this part of myself is so damn sad about being like alone and so really like I'm not alone because I do have so many um, allies friends and loved ones that uh are in my corner and that do support me and that do love me unconditionally and that will show up for me. It is just like, um, just one of the things that's playing out right now is a father wound. So I'm doing my best to use the personal and impersonal lens so that a new point of view can come through. And so I do know that we all have the answers that we need within us and the guidance that we need is always within our, within. And if we ask to receive it and we make the space, then we will like have all we need answered and may not be in the ways that we expect or, or we want, but they do. It's always the answers that we need and it's always the answers that we can understand the messages that come through us yeah they're meant for us to understand and sometimes yeah other people 
will receive what they need from that same message and it will be yeah it won't be the same exact message that we receive because it, um, it's different for our own needs of you know what we're open to understanding or what we're ready or open to receive and um, come back to that inner knowing yeah rather than an understanding I guess but um we do all have access to the answers that we need if we are willing to open and receive. So I choose to see everyone as whole and everyone as powerful. I am willing to let go and change. I am willing to allow myself and my life to change. I am willing to change my mind and I am willing to allow all change. I am willing to welcome change. I am willing to allow others to change. I am willing to allow others to remain the same. So the guidance we are seeking is found within. And I listened to something earlier today um, by Magenta Pixie, and I'll put that link in the description box, and it says the guidance you are looking for is always found within you. So it was just like another af kind of affirmation. Here you go. Yes, that's true. And so, yeah, just let it go. And allow others, like, the room they need on their own journey and, and their own journey of awakening and so um, showing up as the love we are sharing all we love we are all we love <laughs> that's what we are so gratitude joy appreciation value claim my worth and my gifts the gift of presence the gift of being the gift of life the gift of living, loving, and being alive. And so, let's see, I had written something I wanted to share. And so I caught myself thinking, LOL, and stewing in self-pity, self-importance. And what that was about, yeah, was like that I, I really, 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 like, just fell in some grief over um, some of the separation that, you know, I've chosen. I've chosen to separate myself in, in certain ways because I needed to. And I needed to come back home to me. I needed to clear the space and um, come to a quiet place and kind of like take myself out of certain relationships that were too noisy. And so I really have, you know, claimed some space and cleared some room for myself in the last couple of years to uh, be able to hear myself, to hear my own voice, to hear uh, more clearly, to listen more deeply, and know what it was that I really needed and what, what I really wanted, because there was um, so many hooks and pulls and things into other people's agendas, and because of my past history of like wanting to be that people pleaser there was too much noise and too many agendas like going on for me to even hear my own self and so I, I do like kind of miss my loved ones that I haven't really seen or spoken to um, at all or as much in the last couple years. And so like there's part of me that's like kind of grieving the death of like the old, the death, the death of those old relationships, the death of what I had known. And uh, yeah, just letting that go and opening up to, um, to having something, out, something else come through or something else take its place or not take its place, but I guess, yeah. 
maybe just be transformed into something else. And so, yeah, I had been feeling like, gosh, because I've been looking into some heavy things lately about like social manipulation and mind control and just like identity formation and controlling the control of our perceptions so and the control of our beliefs and the, con the control of our own self-concept like implanting those beliefs and you know like certain nefarious agendas like because for subversion or for domination for exploitation for manipulation for control and i'm just so done i'm so over that I'm just so over that. It's such a boring story. I'm ready to move on, you know. But obviously there's certain things, like, to clear before, yeah, totally um, being free, like, of some of those uh, hooks and... addictions yeah maybe because there was that fixer in me that was so addicted to finding everything that was wrong just like so I could feel better and feel safe and know that like I was on the up and up and not on no one's shit list you know and then I felt safe <laughs> felt good about everything okay everybody else is good I must be good too you know and so, yeah, I have really been missing my dad lately and just kind of feeling sad about certain things that I feel like he's not capable of seeing. And like, I don't know why it was so important for me, like to be, for him to be able to see certain things or to validate like what I was experiencing and seeing. Because, you know, I, I've held him like on this pedestal for a long, long time because he's such a loving, emotionally intelligent, compassionate, empathetic human being. And he was such a loving father and he still is a loving father. And so it was, and he's taught me so much about so many things. And he's done such good works of service. And he has such a heart of gold. But there are certain things that he, you know, certain limitations that he had. And it was really like super disappointing to me that I couldn't connect with him anymore on certain levels or in certain ways. And yeah, just kind of feeling sorry about some of those things. And I know he does love me and there's ways that we can connect. But I don't know, there's just, one part of me, this orphan child that feels so rejected and so excluded and so like neglected or just not accepted. It looks like I forgot my tissue today, but um. wants to be said about this. <sighs> yeah, I had I saw where I put him and others, other elders and other people that um shared a lot of love with me. How I put them on pedestals and I wouldn't allow them their own limitations and their own weaknesses and their own journey, like their own, their own, their own fullness of their own journey. And so I had written something about that. Oh.
not sure where it went but yeah I did put them on a pedestal and it didn't allow them their own fullness and it didn't allow them their own power and it didn't allow them their own uh, choices and their own wholeness and their own like ways of being and so yeah I feel like it was maybe just a strategy to feel safe because I needed them to take care of me I needed them I needed their validation I needed their um, verification that I was okay and if they couldn't like see where I was coming from how would they know like truly what was in my heart or what I was seeing and and in a lot of ways it's like there are certain cock blocks and there are certain um, beliefs that we have that keep us from seeing like another uh, point of view or another side of the story and because we're clinging so hard to our own views and it's impossible for us to like see like something else that contradicts with our own views and it's the cognitive dissonance you know and so um, yeah I just kind of believed that they're never going to know like what I've seen and what I've gone through um, what I'm experiencing right now and that's just a shame that's sad like because I want to share a reality with them where I want to feel like I can merge with them where I want to feel um, like I can be with them without uh, without being judged or condemned in certain ways and so we're kind of looking at where I've been in judgment and where I've condemned uh, maybe parts of them or parts of their own journey or their choices or their um, beliefs in certain ways because like for um, you know a lot of my other relationships uh, I'm not invested in certain ways. There's not that history with like the childhood development and things and memories, um, experiences we've had together. So it's like um, easier to like be more neutral when it comes to other people like making their own decisions and not being in judgment about it. But when it's people close to me or when I've had my own agendas or when I've put a lot of energy or investments, energetic investments into something because I want it to be a certain way, or, yeah, that's where, like, uh, I've gotten in my own way and created pain for me. And so, yeah, I'll just take a moment. So, um, what I found was seeing how, seeing why, how, and where I place some loved ones and elders on false pedestals of power, purity, and perfection, and where these projections got frozen, narrow, and rigid, turning me cold and frigid against aspects of myself that did not fit into this small-minded box that became a sarcophagus to rot in. <laughs> so I caught myself, lol. Um, yeah, yeah, power, purity, and perfection, and where these projections got frozen, narrow, and rigid. Yeah, so there was a lot of imprintings that I've been looking into and seeing um, that helped me form my identity of what was good and not, and what was not good, what was right and what was not right. And um, yeah, I was, I was looking into that a little bit last night, and there was some phrase that came to me and I was gonna write it down and I forgot to, but we'll see if it comes back around for me this week. But yeah, it had to do with, yeah, this. So forgiveness, mercy, humility, non-attachment, suspe suspension, allowance, compassion, trust, acceptance, surrender, and unification. Unity with yourself, unity with your fellow man, unity with creator, and unity with creation. And so just like a lot of what I've been looking into is um, has to do with totalitarian societies and abuses of power and abuses of yeah authority 
and how they manipulate people into going along with um, violent um, actions that they would never go along with like in in any other um, situation but for some reason they can con you know concoct and create an objective enemy and turn um, an innocent into an enemy and then justify use of force and violence on these enemies like that are that have been dehumanized and things and um, yeah just because I've been looking at persecution themes because they're very real and uh, very like uh, personal in certain ways uh, I can relate to them in a lot of ways because of my own like, experiences uh, feeling persecuted and I know that we've all been the persecutor and the persecuted, and we all have been the victim and the victimizer. Yeah, that doesn't, yeah, and like totally um, make it all right for me, you know? Like there's certain things I needed to, to see and bring into a new light. And so I'm doing my best to look at some of these things because they're heavy um, with neutrality and acceptance and just like allow myself to feel whatever I, I feel around them but like just letting go of the resistance that I have and the fear that I have of, um, you know, the situation devolving and like us repeating like this tragic history again and again and again and again, like with mass murder and genocide. And um, yeah, I'm not realizing that we are hurting ourselves and we're not honoring our lives. We're not honoring life. Even though we feel like it's like um, in the right to do certain things or to follow certain orders or to identify with certain groups of people. Yeah. That influence and steer us into the slaughterhouse, you know? And so, yeah, there is a couple videos that I watched the other day and I did learn a lot and I, I exact, it was exactly what I needed to see. And I wanted to share like so many of these things and like, it just baffled me too. Like, how is it that, you know, some people just aren't seeing certain things and they're not able to connect the dots and they're not able to look and see the patterns, you know, that are unfolding or that have been playing out. And so, yeah, it was just like, I guess, you know, kind of the don't worry about what they're seeing or what they're not seeing, you know, come back to you and um, check your own vision. What are you seeing? You know, and how are you seeing yourself? You know, how are you seeing them? How do you choose to see them and how do you choose to see yourself? So let go of resistance. So one way to step out of analysis, paralysis, or fear is just to choose what I'm drawn to without expecting, yeah. without expecting a reward or being attached to a certain outcome. I always do my best. I can consider different choices and point of views and offers, but I don't need to worry about every angle and every view, every rabbit hole and every head on the hydra. Let, let go of that uh, hypervigilance, scanning for threats, and hyperfixation. Give it all a damn rest. <laughs> go take a break. <laughs> take a walk or a nap. <laughs> so, yeah, external validation, external verification, external confirmation, and external bias. <laughs> because <laughs> I didn't trust life and I didn't trust myself. Yeah, so I was always needing that. Um, yes, please tell me that I'm right. Please tell me that I'm good. Please, please tell me, you know, that I'm worth loving. Please tell me that I'm worthy. So, um, being dependent on external stimuli, a hyper compulsion, an audience's approval and appraisal. <laughs> Sincerity makes so much sense and so does the concept of being stuck in a socialized mindset and breaking free from that mindset and conditioning. 
the disempowering cop walks and big butts, <laughs> moving and clearing the old blockages and frozen packets of trauma or unprocessed stagnant energy, and perpetually recreating the same old tired stories, reinforcing the patterns of unconscious shadow behaviors con contributing to dis-ease, lack, pain, and suffering, victim consciousness, powerlessness, helplessness, conflict, drama, fear, guilt, shame, pride, hate, greed, and vanity, programming, samsara, the will of suffering, pig, snake, rooster, teachers, reflections, and projections, acknowledge feelings of guilt, shame, and feelings of unworthiness or responsibility, false humility, amnesia, self-importance, and unwillingness to claim power, freedom, and accountability, sovereignty, spiritual maturity, see into the roles we've played, we've played into everything, we've played ourselves a million ways, we've played all roles, we've played all games, grow in and out and through always, love is always, always, love lives through always, this love always, forgive yourself, forgive thyself, forgive yourself, forgive all for everything, there is no thing to forgive, love is free, love always. Transmutation, integration, application, assimilation, alchemization, God self realization, whole self emanation. Oh, my ego just loves to see that it is so very clever. <laughs> There's a quote that I read somewhere, heard somewhere. What was it about? Oh, it was a student talking to his teacher, and the teacher says something about playing or being the fool while trying to be so clever using so much energy to just act clever when he could just let go and surrender and be the wise one that he is. Yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of funny. Those kind of things coming up for me to see. Surrender and be wise. Trust simplicity, humility, authentic receptivity. Ah. Oh. Play, practice, participation, patience, pleasure and pain, potential and possibilities, our love is always. And so, call me by my true names, by Thich Nhat Hanh. I shared that poem the other day and read through it, and that was something that I needed to receive for me to remember, like that compassion, that mercy, that grace and humility. And looking into like the seven stages of genocide and the ten stages of genocide and those kinds of things, um, just to see like into certain strategies and um, mechanisms that are used for social control and manipulation of our perceptions. And so just to have a better understanding of, of how some of those control mechanisms have worked to uh, deceive us and enslave us and how we have used them to deceive ourselves by uh, making ourselves separate from and, and creating an us and them uh, mentality. So it feels like there's an exaggerated version of the devil's advocate and the uh, falsely idealized angel over each shoulder, you know, like that cartoon devil and angel on the shoulder. And both of them, like, <laughs> are telling stories, <laughs> and they're both false. <laughs> and so it is funny. Yeah, to see that. It's like it's logic arguing with itself. It's the monkey mind of what we think is wrong and right. And <laughs> its job is to just doubt and test itself. Its job is to neuter itself of self-impotence through analysis, paralysis, overthinking, and arguing with itself. So it stands to reason that if we were overly attached to certain ideologies and certain outcomes, that we are desperate and possessed by these attachments that we cling to, and that they, they very well may be carried out to our detriment and our undoing exploited through our fears, frustration, and desperation to escape anxiety, discomfort, and misery. We are easily exploited in our desperation, so be aware. So, <laughs> what else can I share today about what I've been alchemizing around this? Yeah, letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go, and surrendering and forgiving, and 
and um, being willing. to allow all the blocks that have kept me separate, yeah, letting them go and allowing them to move through and to be purified and moved, to be transformed, to be removed. <laughs> and um, So forming an identity through the mechanism of profilicity has serious drawbacks. Firstly, it promotes an unhealthy degree of conformity. Profilicity necessitates not just conforming to the preferences of one's peer group, but also conforming to the standards set by those who manipulate the algorithms of social media, or as Wiseman writes, through the ever-increasing gaze of a pervasive audience online, we may become overly pressured, even coerced, toward collective opinion as social media's mechanism of likes, dislikes, friends, and followers constantly subjects us to the crowd's judgment along with that ever-increasing gaze. <laughs> along with that gaze. And that's Jeremy Wiseman, the crowdsourced panopticon. And I'll put that in the description box. So by pr promoting a hyperconformity, profilicity limits our potential as the generalized peer group of social media users and the manipulators of social media algorithms have no interest in many elements that comprise a healthy sense of self or a healthy society. It's all about control. Yeah, and so um, with profilicity, if we step too far out of line, if we are too unique, or if our value system diverges too far from what is deemed acceptable, we will be shunned, shamed, and ostracized. Appearances, superficialities, and adhering to the values of popular culture, pop culture, a cult, the popular cult, the trendy cult, yeah, adhering to the values of popular culture, whatever those are right now, at the moment, to push ideological agendas and <laughs> for control. Yeah, <laughs> that's what matters with profilicity. Not cultivating a harmonized mind, a healthy body, and a fulfilling life. What is more, if we live in a sick society, the sickness will be embodied in the preferences of the generalized peer group. And so, in seeking validation of this crowd and embodying their preferences, we lock ourselves into a sick sense of self. Once we give up our true self to play a role, we are fated to be rejected because we have already rejected ourselves. Yet we will struggle to make the role more successful, hoping to overcome our fate, but finding ourselves more enmeshed in it. We are caught in a vicious cycle that keeps closing in, diminishing our life and being. Alexander Lowen, The Fear of Life. And so this actually reminds me of something that I heard on a podcast. Um, with Matt Belair and Kelly Brogan, I think it was, and um, it was called enmeshment trauma, enmeshment trauma, so that's another term that I get to look at again. So, but the flaws of profilicity are not limited this, to the stunting of our potential, as this method of identity formation also promotes rigidity in belief systems that hinders social progress and generates social conflict. For integral to the construction of a successful social media profile is the display of virtuousness through supporting the moral values of one's generalized online peer group. And that is, um, as Moeller and D'Ambrosia explain, identification with the cause becomes so central and primary in profilicity that, strangely enough, one prefers news that the problem is really as bad as one fears it is, since this affirms the value of the cause and thereby one's identification with it. And so I, that was like uh, one huge thing that I was like super baffled about um, in 2020, is that why, why? <laughs> did people want to see that um, everything or this crisis was as bad as they believed it was because it would make them feel good that they were doing like um, it made them feel good about their own energetic investments and where they were putting their energy and it made them feel right 
And so it was like, even if there was news to the contrary, and like, hey, it's, these these stats aren't really <laughs> aren't really like accurate. It's what's really you know like more accurate is this over here. But that didn't fit the storyline. That didn't like fit in um, to like the agenda and to the cause. And so like we get attached to the cause and to the belief and to yeah to everything that we identify with it's, we see it as ourselves but it's really not and so it's helped me um, to see certain things more clearly and understand and have a little more compassion um, <laughs> for others and where they're coming from because yeah their perceptions you know and our perceptions have all been completely distorted so one's profile built and maintained with sometimes a lifetime of effort. Yeah, our image and our persona. So, and it's just so funny to see that, like how um, our digital profile um, becomes our new sense of self or our new self image. So one's profile built and maintained with sometimes a lifetime of effort and in which one is thus deeply invested would lose its social validity and become obsolete. If the cause is no longer an issue, the identity of those identifying with the cause would be undermined and deflated. And so they have to like, yeah, make it real for themselves in a lot of ways because they identify with it. So the stronger the identification with the cause or a role or an agenda or a story or an identity, yeah, the stronger the identification with the cause, the more the care for the cause also becomes the care for oneself. So they can't like really differentiate between like the cause and themselves. They're, they're, there's no longer, <laughs> yeah, any discrimination there. So under profilicity, the pursuit of truth has given way to the maintenance of identities, and this is a recipe for a polarized society. Many people fail to realize that the moral stances of pop culture are merely stances that further the agendas of corrupt corporations and governments. These technologies may be leading us into the dystopian and prison-like conditions of a crowdsourced panopticon into a world where we are both the prisoners and the guards in an all-pervasive mass surveillance state power, control, manipulation, and domination. And so, social media, why it sickens the self and divides society from October 16th, 2021, Academy of Ideas. And I wrote down a couple of quotes, yeah, and looked at another one, another video that had come out recently um, about the road to political persecution. So there's a lot of different uh, quotes, yeah, that could like be shared and uh, contemplated. A totalitarian society is one in which an ideology seeks to displace all prior traditions and institutions with the goal of bringing all aspects of society under control of that ideology. A totalitarian state is one that aspires to nothing less than defining a controlling reality. Roger, live not by lies. So to achieve its ideological ends, a totalitarian government mobilizes all the mechanisms of the state to exert a strict top-down control of the populace, a mass surveillance system is put into place, and all aspects of life become politicized. So we've seen Nazism, Communism, Fascism, Puritanism, and Scientism, and the rise of technocratic transhumanism. Today, a new so today, a new totalitarian ideology appears to be taking root. This ideology is built on the belief that at current population levels, human beings are parasitic creatures and if allowed to be free, will run, rough will run roughshod over Mother Earth. The totalitarian mind is similar to the schizophrenic mind. It believes the web of delusions in which it is caught. 
It sticks to its ideological model of the world in the face of disconfirming evidence, and it tends to hate those who try to pierce its illusions. A second characteristic of totalitarians is that they hold a contemptuous view of the masses and see normal men and women as inferior and incapable of making good choices. For their own good, it follows, and for the good of Mother Earth, the masses must obey the government, a ruling class. Yeah. And so that's that's the, the, the ideology, like that it's for the for the greater good. Totalitarians also tend to view the masses as unneeded in such large numbers for the realization of their ideological aims. So they view whole segments of the populace as useless eaters who are overpopulating the world. Only where great masses are viewed as superfluous is totalitarian rule at all possible. Hannah Arendt, Origins of Totalitarianism. A further characteristic of totalitarians is their tendency to judge moral issues through a utilitarian lens. When making policy decisions, in other words, totalitarians tend to use the criteria of the greatest good for the greatest number of people as the justification for their actions. Individual rights matter little to the utilitarian. What matters is the good of the collective. And to the totalitarian, the good of the collective always means achieving its ideological ends. This utilitarian approach to moral issues is reflective of a very disturbed mind. It is also characteristic of the moral thinking of psychopaths. The tendency to adopt a calculating and utilitarian approach in judging moral issues is more marked in those with reduced aversion to harming others, lower trait empathy, higher psychoticism, which in itself is characterized by reduced empathy and emotional blunting, and greater Machiavellianism. Ian McGilchrist, The Matter with Things. So a deluded true believer in a utopian ideology, viewing him or herself as a superior being, seeing the world as overpopulated and judging moral issues through a utilitarian lens, such is the mind of a totalitarian and such is the mind capable of committing a mass atrocity. After totalitarians have taken power, all that is needed to initiate the process of political persecution is the inevitable failure of their rule, and fail they will as all attempts to control society in a strict top-down manner are doomed from the start. The more order the totalitarians try to impose on a society, the more chaos they create, and with such chaos comes a never-ending series of crises. But when the crises when the crisis comes, instead of admitting the fault lies with their rule, totalitarians deflect blame to others through the process of scapegoating. For as true believers, totalitarians never consider the possibility that the crisis is a byproduct of trying to force a deluded ideology on society through top-down control. Rather, they continue, oh, they conceive or they convince. Rather, they convince themselves and strive to convince others that responsibility for the crisis lies elsewhere. Who is to be offered as the scapegoat? And so, yeah, interesting. Not taking accountability and blaming someone else so that they can remain the victim. <laughs> yeah, and keep pushing their agendas. It's interesting. So in the early stages of totalitarian rule, it is the non-believer or the dissident who becomes the scapegoat for government failures and made into the objective enemy. Such individuals are blamed for disseminating misinformation and sabotaging the ability of the government to fix the crisis. So the first thing that occurs is the death of free speech. So we have seen this blanket censorship and amped up propaganda. We have rampant propaganda repetitive slogans and neuralistic neurolinguistic programming phrases like the power of suggestion and everyone else is made into an unbeliever a traitor and an uncaring monster an undesirable an objective enemy so this cracking down on free speech for the good of society is a preliminary step and a dangerous warning sign that society is moving in the direction of a violent political persecution. Key to this transformation of the totalitarian into the role of the persecutor is a set of rigid doctrines, isms, schisms, and yeah, dogma. The one that one holds to be absolute or universal truth. Thus, everyone else is made into the enemy or the hindrance to achieving these ideological agendas. This is a slippery slope. 
from this point is not far to persecuting the recalcitrant and in the frenzy of persecution and their deluded self-righteousness only a small further step to rationalize even mass murder genocide under the guise of the greater good of society and that was like kind of paraphrased and taken from yeah um, arthur Lewis, the new inquisitions yeah and all of this was i i take i took from a like a 13 minute video and yeah i spent a couple hours looking into it so to move from the mere silencing of dissidents to imprisoning and committing violence against them totalitarians must turn them into subhumans must turn them into what Hannah Arendt calls the objective enemy. The objective enemy is the ultimate scapegoat. These people are not guilty of any crimes, nor are they a threat to society. Rather, they are men and women whose way of life is incongruent with the totalitarian's ideology. The objective enemy is never an individual whose dangerous thoughts must be provoked or whose past justifies suspicion, but a carrier of tendencies, like the carrier of a disease. Hannah Arendt, Origins of Totalitarianism. So just a few things I've been looking into more deeply for further inquiry, examination, exploration, contemplation, deeper insights, and illumination, unifying all things. So rampant and repetitive propaganda is the tool used to create the objective enemy, and in this situation, words matter, for it is the terminology with which the objective enemy is branded that eventually convinces the totalitarians and much of the public that violence can legitimately, legitimately be used against them. As the crisis intensifies, so too will the propaganda used to demonize the objective enemy. The totalitarians will become increasingly desperate to defect to deflect blame and with free speech outlawed, those with sane and reasoned opinions will find it increasingly difficult to reveal the absurdity of the totalitarian's claims. The masses will be desperate as well, wanting to escape from the misery of a society deteriorating and an economy collapsing. They too will need someone to blame or scapegoat. If the propaganda is successful, the frustration of the masses will turn toward the objective enemy and the ground will be paid for the ultimate crime to be committed. So, but it is not the ruling class who commits the violence against the objective enemy. It is not the ruling class who commits the crimes or the violence against the objective enemy, but the so-called normal men and women. Women and men who are just doing their jobs, just following orders, just doing what they're told, just doing what they've been told is right. Yeah, the road to totalitarian domination leads through many intermediate stages, and during this process, what common sense and normal people refuse to believe is that everything is possible. Hannah Arendt. And so, collective fear stimulates herd instinct and tends to produce ferocity toward those who are not regarded as members of the herd. Bertrand Russell. Collective fear stimulates herd instinct and tends to produce ferocity toward those who are not regarded as members of the herd. And so that's like, yeah, that's like the tribal identification, um, tribal identity, and how that can create an us and them and um, a polarized society. So to fear love is to fear life, and those who fear life are already three parts dead. And so, yeah, where have we become frozen and cold and rigid and dead inside? Like, what, what needs more warmth and more light and <laughs> more love and illumination? Where can we, like, um, offer that and receive that for ourselves? Much that passes as idealism is disguised hatred or disguised love of power. Bertrand Russell. Do not fear to be eccentric in opinion, for every opinion now accepted was once eccentric. Bertrand Russell. <laughs> and so, how you see something is how it will be in your reality. Do you see a problem or do you see an opportunity? One can bring you things you do not want and the other can open doors that you might not ever have imagined. And that was a little quote that I saw last, in the last week by Linnea. And I kind of expanded on that today like how do you see some how do you see something how do you see it and how do you how are we focusing our energy i mean and also 
it's like looking into these things if I'm looking into it like with fear and desperation and my agenda is to resist it and to prevent it and to avoid it and all of that um, then I'm going to be playing right into it and I'm going to be creating actually what I don't want and but if I can look into this with neutrality and compassion and acceptance and faith and mercy and ask for grace and compassion and uh, yeah to see what I need to see um, to unify all things within me with um, and harmony and clarity and integrity um, then I can like let go of the outcome I can let go of the resistance I can let go of the fear of it and I, yeah I can forgive it and I can just release it and it doesn't have to I don't have to be bound to it any any longer and I can free up my own energy to create um, this new love that I'm drawn yeah to to birth through my own being through my own creativity and through my own fertility through my own energy through my own essence through my own souls love and well-being and so yeah that little video that I watched by Magenta Pixie today it was really good for me to see because it did have some good advice about looking at these things and being aware of the nefarious agendas but also nourishing and envisioning and um, putting our energy our energetic investments into like you know the reality that we want to create and see and so we are the change. And so your balanced communication is the seed to unity and the creation of new earth consciousness, Magenta Pixie. You will always be able to navigate through if you hold the peace, knowing, and truth of the new earth, this unity. And do not identify with the lower old earth timelines and the nefarious agendas at play. But observe and bear witness. That's all you're called to do upon it this time, to observe and bear witness. So indeed, do not ignore, do not turn the other cheek, delve deeply into the dark agendas as much as you please, but no, offer no sustenance to their realization when you simply bear witness and you do not identify. So, do you see a problem or an opportunity? Do you see a crisis or an invitation to claim accountability? Do you see an en enemy or a powerful soul on their journey of awakening? So I am faithful. Have faith, bright faith. Hold your faith gently and strengthen your faith. Faith in the unseen, faith in the unseen helpers, faith in the new beginnings, faith in this new growth and new changes taking place. Faith in the miracles always coming and unfolding. Faith in this process of transformation and individuation for the collective of humanity. Faith in the new structures of new earth, reality, unity, reality, faith-based knowing, unity, love, trust, integrity, and the freedom to be. The angel of peace, the angel of grace, the angel of harmony, the angel of Newman or numinosity, angel of gratitude and generosity, angel of faith, mercy, and unity, angel of light and luminosity, angel of gentleness, purity, clarity, angel of prosperity, angel of vision. <laughs> yeah. our feeling of connection to life and the earth must be healed in order to build our new world our feeling of connection to life and the earth must be healed in order to build our new world and so yes it calls for a new foundation a new foundation of wholeness and oneness and uh, built with integrity and so coming back to that wholeness, coming back to ourselves, um, coming back yeah, to be whole within ourselves. And that's the ground that we build on. And so thanks for letting me share with you and thanks for listening. I'm sure I'll have a lot more to share in a few days. And see where this see where this takes me. <laughs> see where I get to follow, you know, certain threads. And uh, there's one more thing that I'm going to share from a book that I picked up the other day, and um, I had bought 
some books a couple months ago. It was like a pack of five different books. And um, yeah, one or a couple of them were actually on anarchy, which actually means uh, the absence of rulers or the absence of a ruling class where everyone is free to be their own master, the master of themselves. And so that's what really, well, that's what anarchy means. <laughs> so um, this one came with the pack of books. It's called Sedition, Subversion, and Sabotage Field Manual Number One, a three-part solution to the state. <laughs> and it's got a little scorpion on there. And I flipped it open the other day, and I flipped open to 101. Who has government enslaved? Who is the child, the brother, the mother, the friend, or someone government has murdered or unjustly imprisoned? Who has tried to start a business but was overwhelmed by regulations or taxes? Who has tried to catch a fish to feed his children but didn't have the proper government permission slip? Who has struggled through the death of a parent only to find government has ravished the estate and left the family in debt? Who has ever looked in the rearview mirror of their automobile and has been gripped by fear, knowing the cop behind them can rape them and beat them to death and never be punished for his crime? Who has had their life turned upside down by an uncaring half-wit dead-eyed government bureaucrat just doing his job? Who has never been directly confronted by authorities yet has compassion for the downtrodden and empathy for the victims of oppression? These are potentially our friends, supporters, and possibly even our fellow saboteurs. And with every filmed police brutality, with every repressive act of government, with every asset seizure, with every drone that kills a child, the state creates more of them every single day. Who takes orders at the restaurant? Who fills prescriptions at the pharmacy? Who empties the trash at the office? Who stands guard at the factory late into the night? Who installs the wires in the new government courthouse? Who repairs the heating cooling system at the police station? Who routes the airplanes over the vast expanses of the prairies? Who programs the traffic lights that keep the surges of life flowing through the city during rush hours? Who drives the ambulance that brings the suffering to the hospital? Who bravely walks into the burning building to save a life? Who is the trusted IT specialist that has access to the network that holds the video that the world needs to see? The answer to the same, the answer is the same as above. The answer is, it is us. The abused, the victims of government, and those sympathetic and the empathetic to our plight, and the state creates more of us every single day. We are everywhere. We have no great leader, and we must never have a great leader. We are regular people living regular lives. So, yeah, that was pretty interesting for me to say. Like, it's not somebody else's job. Like, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. It's all of us that, that, are, that are creating reality. Um, we, yeah, let's, let's uh, look into where we've given our power away and our accountability. Like, let's reclaim that. Let's reclaim our freedom, our power, and our responsibility. And yeah, in a way, maybe like some of this, because um, what I just read on page 101, that kind of does, reminds me of Fight Club in, a, in, <laughs> in some funny ways. Like, yeah. But, I know it's interesting <laughs> in a lot of different ways. So we'll see what we can do with that and how that wants to come out and play. But um, yeah, it's interesting that we do have, we do have our responsibility. And I feel like in a lot of ways, like, it's time to grow in and out and through and claim that spiritual maturity and um, evolve our consciousness from the victim consciousness that it's been stuck in. <laughs> so empowering ourselves and empowering others and empowering change. And so I love you. Thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you again soon. I hope you're well. I love you. We'll see you for now.